Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. Well, greetings, everyone. Welcome to Hotline Ministry. What effect does sin have in a believer's life, and what effect does sin have in the church's life? We're going to discuss that when we come back. Well, once again, greetings, everyone. Welcome to Hotline Ministry. I'm Pastor Harold Noyes, pastor of the Community Christian Church located in Athens, Vermont. Alongside is my co-host, Pastor Timothy Golden. He's pastor of Life on, Ma- on Main <laughs> <laughs> in Charlestown, New Hampshire. And it's our joy to be able to uh, come to you again and to present to you the Word of God and to apply it to our hearts today. You know, so many people want to think that the Word of God is archaic, it's uh, so old-fashioned, it's, it uh, is, is out of date, all of those things. But mm-hmm. we believe, certainly, that the Word of God is still very real, very true, very mm-hmm. living, very uh, applicable to our whole situation today in our life. Yep. And Paul really demonstrates that, which has been in our study now for a number of weeks in the book of Galatians. You know, Paul mm-hmm. has really demonstrated that, wait a minute, you have the law, and all the law does is kill, mm-hmm. but then you have the Spirit of Christ, and that gives life, and we have to live in the Spirit of, of Christ, mm-hmm. not back in the law. Mm-hmm. Now, Tim, the question we have, and this is going to be the discussion of today, is, okay, I'm not under law, I am under grace, I am under Spirit, I'm not under... You know, the the commands, if you will, whatever. So, therefore, I can just live any way I want to live, do anything I want to do, because that's okay. I can do it. Hmm. Is that biblical? No. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's definitely not a yes or no question. No. Uh, it, that's a big fat no. Um, in fact, if anything, that liberty that we have requires us to live a life of restraint, even more so. Um, it's not to live in bondage, but it is to live a life that is that definitely has purpose, that has certain boundaries to it. And I heard the analogy used this way once. It's a lot like water. And we've experienced this uh, with all these uh, heavy rains we've had lately and the flash flooding that has happened. Without boundaries, without some sort of um, limitation, Water runs rampant and, and it destroys. But if you have the banks, it channels that stream to be able to be powerful, to be able to be useful. And it's the same thing in our, in our lives. You know, we may have liberty through Christ, but that liberty has got to be channeled. It, it's got to be exercised in certain boundaries if it is going to have the positive, constructive effect that it's meant to have that brings forth not just life to us, but life to other people. Uh, because if we don't have those boundaries, all it becomes is flood water, and it doesn't do anything but wreak destruction everywhere it goes. So God is not a God of chaos. Right. And certainly we've seen up in this area a lot of chaos over the last week or so um, because of mm-hmm. the flood waters and all of this, a lot of destruction. And chaos will bring that kind of destruction. Mm-hmm. But when you have standards, or the banks, as you call it, so, but when we have standards, then, then you know, there's a, there's a purpose for that. Mm-hmm. And that's what Paul, in my view at least, is, is really trying to convey to these leaders at the church at Galatia. Mm-hmm. Is that, wait a minute, 
you want to put us in bondage. Mm. I want you to live in spirit. Mm -hmm. And now we need to understand the difference between the two. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so what is the difference between um, bondage and liberty? Or liberty and license, even? You know, what is, what is the difference? I mean, how can, how can we today, as the Church of Christ, know that I, I have liberty, but I can't live in license? Mm -hmm. what, is, what is the difference? Well, I think that scripture verse that says, you know, everything may be permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Yeah. You know, it's this aspect that when we think that we have license, it, it gives almost this attitude that I'm allowed to just do whatever, willy-nilly. And that's not, the, that's not the case. With liberty, as we see even in our own country, and we talked about this a little bit last week, that in our country we have liberty, like a lot of countries don't have. But that is not a liberty so that we can simply live life on our own terms in the way that we see fit. With that liberty comes a responsibility. It comes a responsibility within our own country, as well as a responsibility in how we relate to other countries. And so liberty carries a great weight with it. It's freeing, but at the same token, it also carries with it a lot of responsibility and a lot of accountability. Uh, to make sure that we are not just treating that liberty haphazardly. So now, if we put it in Christianese terms, we as, as believers in Christ, mm -hmm. we know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we've, we've trusted him as, as God for who he is, then we still need to understand that there are, light, that there, there are standards in which he has set, mm -hmm. not for salvation, mm -hmm but because of the salvation in which we have. Mm -hmm. You know, salvation comes uh, to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Mm -hmm. You know, and certainly, you know, the param parameters as to what it is we believe, mm -hmm. you know, we can't just believe that he was a good man, can't just believe that he was just, you know, anybody, but we have to believe that he is the Son of God, we have to believe that he died for our sins, we have to believe that he was buried, and he rose again the third day. You know, those are the things that in, in uh, mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 uh, tells us as well as other places. Mm -hmm. So there, there's even the standards there, but this is, you know, this is beyond that. Uh, yeah, well, it's like we, we read through Scripture. Um, as you point out so wonderfully, there, as Paul wrote, that we are saved by faith and not of work so that no one can boast. But you got to combine that with all of Scripture and take a look at like the book of James where it talks about how faith without works is dead. So the faith requires works to be lived out. It's not that we're saved by those works. It, it's not getting the cart before the horse. It's not through works we get saved. You know, that's religion. Right, right. And that's the way most religions operate, is if you do all these things, if you jump through all these hoops, then you will achieve some level of spirituality. Not so with Christianity. Receive Jesus Christ. He did it all. Realize you can do nothing to receive it. But once you've accepted that gift, now is when you begin now to make sure your works line up with that salvation that you proclaim to live by. You know, I think what we're going to do, Tim, is... When we, when we, after we have prayer and you read the scripture that we're going to be looking at, maybe, you know, to hit on, okay, this is who we were, mm -hmm. and this is who our Father was, mm -hmm. but now because we've trusted Christ as our personal Savior, we believe him for who he is, what he did, we have changed families, mm -hmm. we have changed, you know, our inheritance, we have changed all those things, mm -hmm. and because of that, now there's a, there's a whole new different way of living. Any man right. being Christ, he is a new creature. Mm -hmm. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And it just seems to me, before we go into prayer, it just seems to me that what has happened in the believer's life, many believer's lives, not all, but many believer's lives, or even in the life of the church, is that we have, we have gone downhill mm. in respect to what we think about sin, mm -hmm. what we think about doing those things that are contrary to God. Sin is anything contrary to the glory of God. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, you know, the church has, has uh, gone, like I said, gone downhill from there. Mm -hmm. And it is affecting, in my view, the witness that the church has. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that. But we're going to open in prayer. I'm going to have you read Galatians 5, verses, what, 9 through 15. And then we will discuss those and maybe go a little further than that, but discuss that, all right? 
Father, we thank you so very much for the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you that he is the Son of God, but we thank you that he is God. Mm -hmm. And that he came down, he left heaven mm -hmm. to die for us, or to live for us, and then to die for us. And now he lives again, seated at the right hand of the Father, for us. And Lord God, because of that, our lives have changed. We've been transformed. We've been regenerated. I like the way Adrian Rogers says it, Lord. We have been regened. Mm -hmm. So, Father, bless this time. Bless our discussion. And we'll thank you in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. So I'll be reading out of the New King James this morning. And it says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you in the Lord that you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Wow, what a, what a powerful, powerful, um, what's the word? Uh, admonition, mm -hmm. I guess, that, that Paul gives to the leadership of this church, and he's giving to the leadership and believers mm -hmm. today for us, is that, wait a minute, when we allow just a little bit of sin to come in and infiltrate, but not only infiltrate, but stay, mm -hmm. you know, um, because all of us, there are times that sin comes in and infiltrates us, mm -hmm. you know, or there's times that just in the, in the heat of the moment, or whatever the case may be, you know, we may, we may slip, we may fall, we may do things we, we would not do normally. Mm -hmm. The thing is, as I look at this, Tim, is Paul is saying, where are you staying? Mm -hmm. You know, a little leaven leavens a whole lot. If you let that little leaven stay within you, what's going to happen? It's, it's going to it's, it's going to mm -hmm. build and, and grow, and it's going to become, you know, Paul, Paul goes, you know, and says this, that his sin is ever before him. Now that mm -hmm. doesn't mean that he he walked around with his chin on the floor, kicking himself all the time because mm -hmm. he's a sinner and all the. No, what he says is this: Look, I keep it before me so that I won't do it anymore, mm -hmm. or it will not become a habit. Right. It will not become my life. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is where the big difference is. It really is. In fact, it reminds me um, of a section of scripture out of Hebrews chapter ten, and kind of preface this a little bit, I think that there's, because you had mentioned before about how it seems like in the church, we've really, we've allowed sin to really infiltrate. And I think a part of it is we've preached nothing but the gospel of grace. And we forgot about the gospel of mercy. Yeah. It's not just the fact that as through grace, we have been given that which we don't deserve. It's his mercy that we don't get what we do deserve. Right. Because he is a holy God. And he has every right to cast down judgment upon us. Uh, but he chooses first to give us a way out, and that being through the grace which comes through the cross of Jesus Christ. But I'm reminded, as you mentioned, about this whole aspect of people wanting to stay in that sin and how because of this gospel of grace that we've preached without the other, we've almost adopted within the church this attitude that, well, it doesn't matter what I do because God's just going to forgive me anyway because his forgiveness knows no, knows no end. All I got to do is just go to him and he will, he's faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. But we like to end it with the forgive me of my sins. Right. But no, his desire is to cleanse you of all unrighteousness so you don't do it again. But I'm reminded out of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, where it says, for if we sin willfully, willfully. Right. after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on testimony of two or three witnesses. 
of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? That's what happens when we deliberately sin, when, when we sin willfully, make a, make a lifestyle of that. Yep. It is trampling the Son of God underfoot, counting the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing. He's just going to forgive me anyway. And insult the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. And then verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands right. of the living God. Right. This is a New Testament scripture. This is an Old Testament. Right. And so it's important for us, I think, to understand as we look at this aspect and this liberty that we have been given, this verse makes it very clear that the liberty does not give us license. You know, because then we are basically saying, that his blood is commonplace. It really isn't all that important. After all, it's just going to be there. And be careful because now you're trudging on, trudging on very dangerous territory because what it's revealing is their heart attitude that my desire, it's not just my actions. It's not just that I'm doing the wrong things that maybe I don't want to do and I, I then have regret after I do them. This is a person who is, has a heart desire to want to stay in their sin. Yep. And we got to be careful of that. Yeah, so I think what, what has happened, and, and it is, you know, it, to say it's the church's fault or the pastor's fault even in some cases, mm -hmm. where we, we want to preach love. We want to preach the love of Christ. Mm -hmm. We want to preach, I mean, because certainly that is who he is. That is, Absolutely. You know, that is who he is. And, but we really hesitate to preach the wrath of God or the judgment of God mm -hmm. or the standards of God. Now, is it because, well, we don't want to offend anybody, mm -hmm. because that certainly goes against our culture these days. Or, with the church, I don't dare to preach that anymore because, well, so-and-so may stop coming, and therefore we won't mm -hmm. get the tithe, and we won't get, you know, mm -hmm. we won't be able to function. Yeah. I mean, well, I think but so it's a fear thing, mm -hmm. I wonder, if, if a lot of preachers don't do it because of a fearful indignation. I, I heard a story. Last Sunday night, my, my associate uh, preached Sunday night, and he even said that there was a, a, a president of a college who preached the biblical aspect of husbands love your wife, the biblical aspect of it. He went on a trip. When he got back, the board had him meet with them, and they fired him on the spot, and he lost all of his benefits. He lost everything. Because mm -hmm. he stood up and preached the full counsel of God. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and I have to wonder, are there a lot of preachers today, even Bible preachers, who are afraid to mm -hmm. really stand up because, well, wait a minute, you know, my livelihood, my house, everything, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, it all depends on that. And therefore, I have to preach more on the love of God and not as harshly on the mm -hmm. judgment of God than... Then what? Well, I, I think if, if we trace it back, and thus saith I not the Lord. Right. But it certainly seems like if you, tr if you go back to, say, even the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the church at large was very hellfire and brimstone. Mm -hmm. It seemed like that's all that was coming from the pulpit was judgment, judgment, judgment. And there wasn't much, there wasn't grace being preached. Right. And it's the old, what they call the pendulum theory. You know, that whenever you, whether it's a culture, whether it's the church, whatever it is, that when we tend to err on one end, on one extreme, what will ultimately happen is you'll swing the pendulum the equal distance, the opposite direction. And what seemed to happen, especially as you entered into the later 70s and the, well, actually, I would say it even started maybe in the, maybe the late 60s. Late 60s yeah. um, you started seeing this huge gravitation as a culture to this love, peace, joy concept. And you also saw the church swinging from this judgment aspect and the hell being a real place to let's just talk about heaven. Let's talk about the God of mercy, the God of love, um, the God that will, you know, who gave his only son, which is all true. Yeah. And we're not arguing that. But what, I, what we are saying is that we were here, and what we did is swung the pendulum so far this way, we no longer talked about hell. We no longer talked about the punishment of sin. We no longer talked about the judgment of God. And now what we're doing is we're reaping what we have sown as a church, which is basically having a bunch of disciples that have risen up 
that have been so taught about the love of God, the concept that God's going to hold me accountable for my sin seems to not be considered important to them. And so I think we're seeing almost this need to swing the pendulum the other direction again to try to get to that plumb line, to try to get that balance of all of what it means for God to be a God of mercy and grace, but also to be a God of judgment. You know, one thing, Tim, and, and we can discuss this a little bit, um, certainly all sin was paid for on the cross of Calvary. Mm -hmm. All sin was paid for on the cross of Calvary. I want to make sure everybody understands that. Yep. However, what we do, how we respond, how we live, still makes us accountable to God. Mm -hmm. You know, even though sin is not a, a, a problem as far as Christ is concerned because he died for that. He paid mm -hmm. for that. However, what am I going to do with what he did for mm -hmm. me? Am I going to? Faith without works is dead. Mm -hmm. And we also read, for example, if you go into, I think it's Revelation 20, mm -hmm. is, is, wait a minute, when, when God does the judgment, what's it say? He doesn't say he's going to judge for their sin, but he is going to judge them for their works. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid that the church and, and many, many Christians today have not seen that or mm -hmm. do not understand the fact, wait a minute, God, is, God still sees and knows everything we do, everything we say. Mm-hmm. And he keeps records. Yep. Now, he's not keeping records because he's bored up there and he had nothing else to do. So he's keeping records. He's keeping records for a reason. Mm -hmm. And that means that we still are going to have to answer for those. Mm -hmm. Not for eternal life, not for salvation, but in what we present to him mm -hmm. as rewards, what we present to him as crowns. Mm -hmm. We're going to, you know, and, and I don't think a lot of Christians understand that. I don't think a lot of churches understand mm -hmm. that, that we have to, you know, yeah. we have to be very careful. Well, I think that one problem, another, or another problem that we've run into is in the church and having been brought up in the church, we so much preach almost this aspect that God has come, or this ideology that Christ has come to redeem our actions. You know what? You'll know you're a Christian, but that means you need to stop smoking, yep. you need to stop drinking, you need to stop all these other things. Yep. And we almost see a lot of times in churches, the actions are what are preached against as though somehow Christ came to redeem our actions. He did not come to redeem our actions. He came to redeem our heart. And when he gets our heart, you know what happens? He gets our actions. Yep. Because it's out of the the abundance of the heart yep. that we live our lives. It's it's that which begins to now dictate our actions. And so we want to, and I'm talking about the habitual actions yeah, yeah. That, that we're constantly engaged, not, not the once in a while slip ups, that stuff happens. Just like a kid trips and falls, doesn't mean he doesn't know how to walk, yep. you know, when, when he's young, um, just means he's learning. And, and there's that aspect that we go through as Christians, but we need to understand that he came to, to get this. And if he's got my heart, what's going to happen? If I've really given my heart to him, that means I'm devoted to him. That means I fully love him and I want to show my love. I, it's no longer something I'm doing out of duty or out of expectation. It's I'm doing it out of gratitude and out of desire and passion for the one whom I love. And so that's why we say that if he redeems your heart, your actions will begin to follow suit with that. But yet you can give over your actions and still have a heart that's going to not be cleansed and therefore still could end up going to hell. You know, I was just thinking of, uh, and I can't put my eyes on it right now, but we just went through about two weeks ago. We're, oh, yeah, I see it right here. I desire to be present with you now. This is verse 20 of chapter 4 of the same book. Mm -hmm. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Hmm. Now, what, what is he saying? Is, is, he, is he saying to these guys, these leaders, wait a minute, the way you're acting mm -hmm. does not coincide, does not come alongside of who Jesus Christ is mm -hmm. and what Jesus Christ has done for you. A, a, a parable that Jesus gave, or in Matthew 7, it says this, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Mm. You will know them by their fruits. 
Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, mm -hmm. but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good mm -hmm. fruit. And I think that we need to, to be aware of that as believers. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. When people read you or people read me, mm -hmm. what are they reading? Mm. You know, are, are they reading the scriptures put to action? Mm. Are they reading the life of Jesus Christ living in me? Mm -hmm. Or are they reading that, hey, God is, you know, God is one of these, you know, a God who just, he doesn't care. He just willy-nilly, you can do anything you want to do anytime you want to do it because he died for me and he washed away my sins. Mm. And that isn't the God we have. At least no. not in my view. No. Not in my view. And, and Paul is, is really coming to that. Mm -hmm. For example, in the first verse we read this, you know, you read this morning, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Mm -hmm. What place does sin have when we allow sin to reign in us? Romans 5. Mm -hmm. When we allow sin to reign in us, then... What happens to God's righteousness? What happens to God's goodness? What happens to God's life in us? Mm -hmm. um, does that cover it over? Does that bury it? What happens to it? The two cannot coexist. And, and that's basically what he's saying here. Whenever you usually see this word leaven used in Scripture, it's never a good thing. Yep. You know, and so is the case here. A little leaven is going to leaven the whole lump. In other words, the whole life of the believer is going to be affected. You can't think that, well, it's just a little sin. It's just this one little thing. Nobody knows about it. It's way over here. It's not going to have any effect. No, it will. It's going to affect a lot more areas than you realize it's affecting. Because if we allow sin to reign there, what's to keep it from creeping over here to this area or into that area? You know, because what we're basically saying, if I'm going to let sin reign, who am I really letting be Lord? Is it God? Yep. Or is it the devil? You know, and that might sound harsh, but we, we as people need to get back to a little bit more of a black and white mentality because Jesus talked about this. He's like, if you do not follow God, if you're not of God, then you are of your father, the devil. And th there's no middle ground. There's no just living for yourself. You're on one side or the other. And we need to make a choice of what that's going to be. And if we're letting sin reign in any part of our lives, again, not to say that we're going to be perfect. None of us are. But when I sin, what do I do with it? Do I bring it under submission of his lordship? Mm -hmm. Or do I choose to exercise my own lordship and say, I'm going to let this remain? You know, I, a few weeks ago, I preached on Joseph in the Old Testament, and, mm. and we know that Joseph went through some pretty tough times um, trying, wanting to live as God would have him. In mm -hmm. fact, he was a testimony. I mean, the jailer saw it, mm -hmm. that the Lord was with it. I mean, the jailer. So now you get part of his wife, right? She tries mm -hmm. to seduce him. She tries to take advantage of him. They're home alone. You know, he's, he's captain of the house, so he's got rule of the house and all this. And she wants him to lay with her. Mm -hmm. And he runs from her. But, of course, mm -hmm. she got his cloak, so she had, you know, this against him. But I love his response to her. Joseph did not say to her, I, I don't want to do this because, you know, I, I, I don't want to hurt Potiphar, though he didn't want to. I don't want to do it because of any other reasons. But listen to what he says. Verse 9 of Genesis 39. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Right. And what's happened to us, and at least it seems to me, what's happened to us is we fail to recognize, wait a minute, my, my sin does not only affect me. Mm -hmm. It not only affects the people that I've sinned against, but it actually is going against God. Mm -hmm. And that's what sin is. Yep. And that's the top priority. Right. All the other stuff is secondary. Right. You know, that was his first thought and his first aim. I got to please God. I want to please God, no matter what. Yeah. You know, and what's really interesting, if you follow through chapter 
37, 38, 39, 40 in Joseph's life, you find, I don't know, about a dozen times where it says the Lord is with him. The Lord is with him. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do we live and not have sin reign in us? Mm -hmm. We have to keep close in that close proximity of God living in me. Well, as Jesus said, I am the vine, you, you are, are the branches. branches. You know, you cannot exist apart from me. And it's understanding that reality that as believers, we are grafted into Christ, mm -hmm. you know, and everything that we bear, everything that and any fruitfulness of our lives, any life that we might be able to bear is only because of him. And so our whole identity, our whole purpose for being is anchored in him, just like the the branches in the vine. And the minute that we begin to think otherwise is to lop ourselves off from that vine. And then what happens? It dies. It dies, yep. And it can't bear forth fruit. It might still have leaves on it for a while, but over time they wither up and they fade away. Yep. And and certainly we're seeing this. And mm -hmm. it is, it's been all through history, mm -hmm. you know. But because of our current whole situation in our world today, it just seems like it, it's 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 becoming worse and worse and worse. Where, mm -hmm. where we just do not recognize, well, Paul calls it the sinfulness of sin. Yeah, we don't any longer see it as sinful. Mm. We see it as a mistake. We see it as some other word that mm -hmm. we put in place of. But you don't want to call it sin. You yeah. know. Um, that's a that's an offensive word or whatever. Mm -hmm. And wait a minute, no, we we need to get back to seeing the sinfulness mm -hmm. of sin. Yeah. Now, have you ever heard this, Tim? But it's just a little thing. <laughs> you know, it's just a little lie. Mm -hmm. You know, not a great big one, but it's a little lie. It's a little white lie. Hmm. Well, a lie is a lie, mm -hmm. right? I mean, God doesn't measure. Lies. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what man does. Man puts mm -hmm. the measurements on things. Yeah. You know, well, my lying is not as bad as somebody murdering somebody. Mm -hmm. My lying is not as bad as somebody doing some other horrendous stuff. No. What does God see? God sees mm -hmm. sin, period. Mm -hmm. And that's it. It's not just even that the, a lie is a lie is a lie. It's a lie equals sin. Right. Murder equals sin. sin. You know, stealing equals sin. Adultery equals sin. Homosexuality, well, need we go there, right? We don't, we don't write the book. Right. God, right. Just God, God, God already us. did. Yeah. You know, but the, but the point being, any one of those, we will try to measure them up against each other as far as which one's greater, which one's not. It's not that at all. If A equals B, remember this in algebra? A equals B and B equals C, therefore A equals C. <laughs> you know, it's not a matter of these things equaling each other necessarily. They all equal sin. You know, they all have the same end result, which is death, unless it's taken to the cross and left there for Jesus' blood to cleanse us from. You know, so we need to stop, let's stop grading things. They were never meant to be graded. It is what it is, and all sin, my Bible tells me, leads to death. Yeah. You know, what's really interesting, and I got an article yesterday, and I, just for, you could probably tell me what the title would be, is now in our culture, you know, instead of individualism, mm -hmm. we now want to do groupism, mm. you know, and you put this group against this group, and there's no longer individualism, and, and wait a minute, no. We all are responsible for our sin, mm -hmm. you know, and therefore, you know, we all need to take that responsibility. Yep. But it seems in our culture, it's, it's trying to do away with personal responsibility, mm -hmm. Talk, you know, and all that. And, and God doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. It's all in, based on my environment. It's all based on something that was in my background. Yeah. And therefore, I don't own any yeah. um, ownership of this. Right. I mean, it's all my parents' fault because that's the way I was brought up, right? Mm -hmm. No, I'm sorry. I can't do that anymore. Right. You know, I mean, it just doesn't happen. So when Paul says to this leadership group, a little leaven, if I let this go, mm -hmm. if I leave here without correcting this problem or even addressing this mm -hmm. problem, 
What's going to happen to the, happen to the church at, at Galatia? Hmm. What's going to happen to your ministry? Right. What's going to happen to those people that, mm -hmm. that God has led you to? Mm -hmm. You know, because I can't do that. I cannot mm -hmm. just walk away and let it go. A little leaven mm -hmm. leavens the whole lump. Yeah. And I like that. I can't just walk away and let it go. Because that's the way leaven operates. Yep. You don't have to feed leaven. You put that leaven in the lump, and all you got to do is just not pay any attention to it, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause that thing to rise. Yeah. You know, and it's going to multiply. And so this aspect of, well, I, I, I can just avoid it. I don't have to deal with it, is a lie from the pit of hell. Right. We have to deal with it, because if we don't deal with it, it will deal with us. Right. Yeah, so, you know, and I really love the way Paul is doing this, because I'm sure, you know, James and Peter and John and all the mm -hmm. rest of them that he's confronting in this, and we, we talked about that in the previous chapters, you know, I'm sure they're saying, Paul, let it go. Mm -hmm. Paul, stop hopping on this. And what is Paul saying? No, I need to continue hopping on this mm -hmm. because it is going to infiltrate the whole church and it will destroy. Mm -hmm. And it will destroy not only the church, but it will destroy ultimately, even more importantly, the cause of Christ. Mm -hmm. And that is the key. Yep. That is the key. And, and, you know, so Paul says, look, a little leaven, if I let it go, it's going to fester, it's going to increase. You know, mm -hmm. if you don't take antibiotics for a virus, guess what? You're mm -hmm. going to get sick and possibly die. Mm -hmm. So you need to deal with it. Yep. And Paul is saying that in verse 11, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Then he goes in verse 10, I have confidence in, in you through the Lord. Mm -hmm. He says right now, if, as I look at your life, like in verse 20, mm -hmm. I have doubt of you, mm -hmm. but because of, I know God's grace, I know God's mercy, I still have confidence that you're his. Mm -hmm. However, you're not acting like it. Mm -hmm. You're not proving it. Yep. You're not showing it. You're not responding to mm -hmm. him. And therefore, I have confidence through the Lord, but certainly you're not bearing that good fruit mm -hmm. that a good tree would bear, mm -hmm. right? That's what yeah. I find. So and I think that, too, another aspect of that is this concept of I have confidence in you, in the Lord. It's also helping them understand, look, just as the Lord looks at us, God doesn't look at us and see us as we are. He looks at us and sees us for what he knows we can become. Yeah. And his desire is to nurture us to that point. And that is a bit of what Paul's even emphasizing here. I've got my doubts. But I also have confidence in you and the Lord, because I know that if he sees potential in you, you, you can get beyond this. Yeah. Um, but you're going to have to work at it. You know, it's almost like back in, when I was growing up and, and such. And of course, those were, those were in days where, you know, parents were a whole lot tougher on their kids, I yep. guess, than the other day. But, you know, my dad, my dad used to say to me, now, I, kn I know that you're better than that. Mm hmm You know, and... You, you know, you don't have to go there. Isn't that what Paul is saying in verse 10? Mm -hmm. I think he's really saying, look, I have confidence in you that you will be none otherwise minded. You're going to see my way of thinking. You're mm -hmm. going to see what I am talking about yep. because you have mm -hmm. Christ in you. Yeah. And the Spirit of God is going to reveal to you that what you're saying is not correct. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you will change. Mm-hmm. That, that's what I see in verse 10, that you will be none other minded, but he that troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever to be. Mm -hmm. and, and I look at this and he's saying, wait a minute, I know that somebody has drawn you away, mm -hmm. you know, and because you and I know that, for example, it could be the devil, it could be, mm -hmm. you know, or an advocate of the enemy, the mm -hmm. advocate of the devil. He's going to get his. Okay, he's going to face his judgment one day. Mm -hmm. I know that. So don't follow him. Mm -hmm. Don't go that way, all right? Because he is going to face his, his uh, reward. That's mm -hmm. all there is to it, or lack it. of, right? So he does that. And then you have in verse 11, and I, and he calls them brethren. So mm -hmm. that goes back up to verse, I have confidence in you in the Lord, calls them brethren, and I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased? So what is he saying? He said, wait a minute. 
if I were to preach this method for salvation, then what effect will that have on what Jesus did on the cross? Mm. It would be of, I would like the term, and Paul uses it in other terms, it would be of none effect. Mm -hmm. You have taken away the effectiveness of the cross. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if we were able to somehow achieve it through keeping the law, there would have been no need for the cross. Yeah. But there was a need for the cross, because that's the only way salvation could really come. Yeah. So Paul also uses another term that I find fascinating, is his other term is this, he would have died in vain. Mm -hmm. So if circumcision is the way to salvation, mm -hmm. then God n would not have had to say to Jesus, mm -hmm. go down and rescue a people from me. Mm -hmm. You know, because we believe certainly that Jesus was not created for Christmas. Jesus always had been. Jesus mm -hmm. was with the Father. In the beginning was the Word, mm -hmm. and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Mm -hmm. So therefore, Jesus always has been. He was not created for the cross, in effect, but he had to do the cross because of what, how, you know, mm -hmm people that God wanted. Yeah. Well, but I look at that, um, in the New King James, they, they worded it this way, then the offense of the cross has ceased. You know, there's two ways you can read that one word, offense or offense. Yeah. And the thing is, the cross was both. And, yeah. and he, you know, in some ways he was really addressing both. The offense of the cross would have ceased. In other words, as you said, why did he come? You know, it was to conquer sin, death, and the grave. You know, and that could only happen as Christ willingly gave himself on the cross and thereby God moving offensively versus defensively to gain us back. But the, it also says the offense of the cross. Right. Because the problem with the cross and what makes it so offensive to so many people is this simple truth. If I couldn't achieve it and the cross was necessary, that means I am dependent and I owe him who died on the cross my very life. And that can be offensive to some oh, people yeah. because it means I, I, don't, I can't live for myself. It means I, I don't get to call the shots. No, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you were destined to sin only because of the grace of God have you been rescued from that. And so being willing to simply eat that humble pie and say, yeah, I am nothing apart from him, and therefore I owe him my everything. And that means I'll let every aspect of my life line up with him, even if that means letting go of some of my old religious ideologies, yeah. right, like the circumcision. Mm -hmm. You know, which is actually in verse 12, because yep. he goes and says, I don't know who brought you to this. I don't know who has swayed you against mm -hmm. the gospel. But I would, verse 12, that they even cut off which trouble you. Mm -hmm. So many do not understand that, wait a minute, one way to conquer sin is to get away from it. Mm -hmm. Don't do it. I mean, don't allow it. You know, if you, for example, and I'm just using this, if you are an alcoholic, don't have booze in your house. Mm -hmm. Why? Because one of these days, things are not going to go mm -hmm. well, and you're going to take it up again. That's all there mm -hmm. is to it. So if, if it's not there, then you don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. Same thing with pornography. If you have a problem with pornography, then you be careful. You put locks on your computer. You do things to, to help you mm -hmm. not have any more. You've got to cut it off. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, like you said. The vine in the branches. Yep. He cuts off the old stuff that isn't going to grow, mm -hmm. that isn't going to be fruitful, and he does it. He prunes it so that the rest of it is mm -hmm. going to even flourish. Yeah. Well, it was like an individual I was talking with just this, this last week. Uh, she was sharing with me about uh, her own testimony and the life that she was in, though she was a Christian at the time and kind of into the singing scene and that kind of thing. But there came a point when she had to look at herself and say, you know what, even though I'm not going down this path, my life is not affecting them and causing them to turn. So there, there became this understanding that over time, if I'm not going to influence them, there's a greater opportunity that they may end up influencing me. 
And so that person got out of that scene. And it, it's that old aspect, you know, that you throw in a, a clean shirt with a bunch of dirty clothes. Yeah. The clean one doesn't make the dirty ones clean. It's right. just the reverse that happens. And so it, it's it's learning to have that kind of outlook. And that's what we we're saying here is, look, the, whoever this is that's in your midst and is teaching you this, he's polluting you. Right. Or she is polluting you, whichever it was. But you, you're turning away from what you know to be true. You've allowed your cleanness to get dirty. Yeah. So it's time for that to get cut off. You know, one of the things that I found that, that happened at the fall was that when Lucifer tempted Adam and Eve mm. and they took of the fruit, what happened to them is they became weak. Mm-hmm. And we're seeing that today as believers, that we are becoming weakened mm -hmm. to the culture, to the things that are happening. So someone would throw in your face, for example, in mine, he would say, yeah, but the Bible says in First John, greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I have to hang around with them because God is greater and he'll get the ultimate victory. What do you say to that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well... Again, I think it's one of those areas you have to tread very cautiously. There may be some people that, yes, that is true. I and mean, we can't make a blanket statement um, because there may be some people that are strong enough in the Lord that that'll happen. But there are others that aren't, right. you know, and, and will ultimately become affected. And, and that's kind of like what I was talking about with this one other individual. They look, not they had started to influence her, but she could look at her life and theirs and see, I am not having an impact here. So if I'm not going to impact that, could they impact me? They may, they may not. I right. don't know. But am I willing to take that chance? Yeah. Is the, the risk was too great. Exactly. And so that person pulled out of that. And, and so, and again, that's where walking, and he talked a little bit about this later, and I'm sure that's where we're going to get next week, yeah. is where he talked about walking in the spirit. Right. I think this is where that comes in, because uh, you can't just cookie cut it. Right. You know, but yeah, you've got to be very, very careful to make sure, are you being influenced positively or are you having a positive influence on them or it's just the reverse happening and if the reverse is happening it's time to step away from that and then leave the, you know leave that situation to god's direction you know i think the fall back in genesis you know chapter three and four i think the fall is a good picture for you and me though mm -hmm. because what was adam and eve like before lucifer slid it over and mm -hmm. tempted them they were in perfection. Yep. They were walking with God. They were talking with God. They had an intimate relationship mm -hmm. with God. But what is the enemy like? He's a snake that likes to slither in and, and get you when you least expect it. Mm -hmm. He wants to do something and, you know, make you start thinking, well, it's not that big a sin. It's not that big a deal. You know, I'll only do it this once. Mm -hmm. I mean, I did that as a kid with cigarettes. Oh, sure, I'll just take one because I wanted to be in with the crowd and I wanted to do all this. Next thing I know, I'm hooked. Mm -hmm. I'm going to the store and I'm buying a pack, you know. And for me, you know, that certainly was wrong. Mm. And, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. I got hooked for a while. So, you know, wait a minute. It wasn't anything I intended to do. Mm -hmm. It wasn't anything that I, that I thought to do. I didn't lay there at night saying, okay, I think I'm going to, mm -hmm. you know. No, it just didn't. Mm -hmm. But that's what happens. That's why I think that Paul is saying, wait a minute, some, some of us have to take that ultimate, make that ultimate sacrifice mm -hmm. and say, hey, wait a minute, I can't do this with you anymore. Right. Because it is affecting me mm -hmm. and my relationship with Jesus Christ, and that is more important. Mm -hmm. That is more important. Let's go to verse 13, Tim, because I think that this is, to me, this is the, the whole picture that Paul is now presenting to us. Yeah. A little 11, 11, so hold on. It says, for brethren, once again, he uses that term, so he's not questioning their salvation. Mm -hmm. I think he's questioning their works. I think he's questioning, okay? Yep. So, for brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not uh, liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. And to me, that is the mm -hmm. key. Wait a minute. I have every right to do anything I want to do, even as a Christian. I can still go out because God gave me free will. I can go out and do mm. that. However, is it going to be beneficial? That's mm -hmm. what she was saying. Is it going to benefit? First of all, is it going to benefit me? Mm -hmm. Secondly, is it going to benefit those around me? Mm -hmm. 
If it isn't, don't use it for an occasion to the flesh. Mm -hmm. You know, or if I have the liberty to do something and you don't have that liberty to do something, mm -hmm. you know, um, then should I do that thing in front of you to cause mm -hmm. you to stumble? God says no. Mm -hmm. No, no. You make the sacrifice. Right. Don't cause your brother to stumble. Do not mm -hmm. be a stumbling block to your brother or to your sister. Right. Don't do it. Mm -hmm. And that's what, to me, that is what Paul is really bringing out here. Mm -hmm. um, verse 14, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Mm -hmm. yeah. And notice how what he's really addressing here is heart, not action. Yep. He didn't just say, do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another. Yeah. That's action. He said, but through love, serve one another. Love is heart-based, yep. right? So it's making sure your heart is right. Well, how do we love? Well, the only way we can love with the kind of love that he's talking about where you're able to serve one another is when God's love so overtakes you. Yeah. You know, and it's your, out of your love for him, it's out of that vertical relationship, that then your horizontal relationships become affected to the point that you are willing to serve them, consider them better than yourselves, where you're able to l even love your enemies, right? And so it's getting, it's again, starting with that hard attitude and then allowing that to flow through the actions. So what you're saying is finishing, finishing up verse 15, if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. Mm -hmm. So my question for you today, and we get to close, my question for you today is this, what consumes you? Mm -hmm. Is it your love for the Lord Jesus Christ? That is what consumed Joseph. Mm -hmm. And he ran away from part of his wife. Why? I cannot sin against my God. Right. Okay? That's what consumed him. Or do we consume ourselves and say, yeah, well, it's gratifying, and well, I know Jesus paid for it, so it's okay. Wait a minute. Mm -hmm. That's going to break that relationship. Mm -hmm. Comes out of those three temptations that Christ had to suffer, right, in, in the wilderness. Lust of the eyes, lust, lust of the, the flesh, and the pride of life. Those are the three main areas Satan will always try to come at you. And if you give in to any one of those, you'll get consumed. Right. Next week, chapter uh, 5, verses 16, maybe through 26, we'll see, and see how that goes. But certainly this has, to me, been a great discussion, mm. Tim, on what, what is our responsibility? First of all, my responsibility is I have to make sure that my relationship with Jesus Christ is in his righteousness and in mm -hmm. his holiness. Um, I'm, my responsibility also is how is this affecting my brothers and sisters in Christ? Mm -hmm. How it affects me, how it affects them. Because how it affects them is going to tell, uh, play a big part in my relationship with Jesus Christ. Absolutely. So, little leaven, leavens the whole lump. I'm Pastor Harold Noyes, pastor of the Community Christian Church. We're located on the Lower Road in Athens, Vermont. We have 9.30 Sunday morning service. We also have a 6 o'clock service on Sunday evening so that if you, you know, your fellowship doesn't have an evening service and you desire to um, get in another service and, and, and spend more time with other believers, come on over 6 o'clock Sunday night. We have Bible study during the week and we can plug you into those. Or if you're in the Charlestown, New Hampshire area, visit us at Life on Main at 276 Main Street, the location of the Abundant Life Center. And we have services at 11 o'clock every Sunday morning. We have a time of fellowship and coffee at 10 a.m. on Sundays as well. Also have small groups that meet during the week. Call our office, we'd be happy to plug you into those. We wanna thank you for tuning into the broadcast and let people know there's a lot of ways to be able to access this, whether it's through community stations throughout South uh, Eastern Vermont and the Northeast Kingdom, as well as through fact8.com's website or uh, going on YouTube and finding Heartline Ministries there or through our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Heartline Ministries. And if you don't like video and like to only have audio, find us on the, all the popular uh, podcast providers as well. For Pastor Tim, I'm Pastor Harold saying thank you for watching Heartline Ministry.